I'm Joe Haddo and this is our series of interviews with the Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year Award, Long List Ease. Produced and curated by Harrogate International Festivals in partnership with Theakston's Old Peculiar, WH Smith and The Express and it's great to have you with us. Today I'm joined by an author, playwright, journalist and critic who has published nine novels. These include Apple Tree Yard, Black Water, and most recently, Platform 7, which we'll be talking about today. Louise Doughty, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. It's really lovely to see you. And what a lovely array of books you have behind you there. Yes, those, I'm, I really love those bookshelves. Um, <laughs> I think for the first you know, 15 years in this house, the books were just in boxes in the corner of the room <laughs> until we finally cracked and painted the ball, ball blue and threw up. And I, it, it, they please me every time I walk in the room. I have to say we had a big cull though, uh, which was pretty dreadful. We had to throw out, I think, about half. And um, that was quite painful, actually, deciding who'd get the chop. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. That's. Did you do that that whole uh, what gives you joy thing when you were looking at the front covers? I tell you what I did is I was very ruthless on the stuff that I've kept because I've always meant to read it, read it, but yep. you know, knew yep. knew I never would quite get round to it. I thought, no, you know, really, it's so easy to just let the stalagmites and stalactites, whichever it is, building up on the floor, <laughs> build up of books that you you know in your heart of heart you'll never get round to. So mm. yeah, those are the things. And a lot of proofs that I get sent, of course, because you know, like you, uh, you know, you get sent just hundreds, hundreds yeah. over a yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I always feel very guilty when I throw out a proof uh, <laughs> because I just know that's like a baby embryo author that I'm getting. <laughs> <myself>, so <laughs> I know, but we just don't have the space, do we? You know, especially. We don't, I mean, no. I'm in. If you're in London, but it's the space is of a premium here, so we just can't, Absolutely. can't yeah. have all those yeah. books that we want to. Um, no, but anyway, it's totally. looking it's looking resplendent, I have to say. Okay. Um, and uh, congratulations for being longlisted for the award. Um, it's a fabulous book, Platform Seven, your latest, and it's a sort of ghost story meets psychological thriller. Um, can you tell us where the idea came from and maybe a little bit about the, the story for those that haven't sure. read it? Sure. Well, it, it's pretty quirky, isn't it? Which is why I was yeah. so thrilled <laughs> to be long-listed for the award because it's, it's an odd book, guys. It's a bit weird. Um, the idea came from my travels in the East Midlands. I grew up in a small town there and then I went to university in Leeds and then later I did a postgrad in Norwich and then I moved to London. And with each of those places, when I went back to visit my parents or the town I grew up in, um, I had to change trains at Peterborough Railway Station. And I've spent many a miserable, cold winter night freezing. You know, the one thing you could always guarantee is that the waiting room would be locked. The other thing you could always guarantee is that the ladies' toilet would be locked. And it's freezing <laughs> cold and you've forgotten the hat and the wind is blowing across the fence. And it used to be my standing joke that if I'd been bad and died and went to purgatory, I would find myself trapped on Peterborough Railway Station. <laughs> and so I decided to set an, a whole novel there. That was clever of me, wasn't it? I mean, the <laughs> Blackwater, the novel before, the research, I was walking the rice fields of barley. And this one, I was spending nights on Peterborough Railway Station. So I created a character who, as you say, she's a ghost. Um, she's haunting the station. She's died on the station in mysterious circumstances, and she's stuck there until the mystery of her death is solved. Um, but as usual uh, with my novels, all is not what it seems. Um, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a secret. Um, there's a lot of dark stuff going on. And in the middle section of the book, you actually go back into Lisa, as she's called. You go back into her past, and you find out about her life before she was a ghost, um, she narrates that in a, a, a much more normal narrative style. And for the final third, she comes back to the station, but her memory of who or what she was when she was living has been restored. And the two strands of the narrative come together, the past and the present. And somebody comes to a sticky end. Shall we say? <laughs> and well, yes, yeah, shall we say? And leave a dot, yep. dot, dot there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you actually went to Peterborough Station and you know, in, in the dead of night, did you, and sort of just see what it was I did. Like. I spent the night there, and uh, the night staff were fantastic. They were very tolerant. I mean, I was there. I don't know how they do it. It was absolutely freezing. Wow. It was close to Halloween, uh, early <laughs> November. I had on my Parker 
my beanie hat, my fingerless gloves. It was a look best described as bag lady with laptop. <laughs> and I spent the night there. And even with the occasional night staff around having cups of tea in the duty team leader's office, it was very, very creepy. I mean, it is seven platforms. Um, the geography of the station is very um, closely described in the novel. And the mist drifts along and a fox trots along the tracks. And then every now and then a freight train comes in and there's this huge kind of metallic screeching that fills the air as it kind of chugs, almost driverless, sort of humanless, uh, through the station and all falls quiet again. And I also went out with the British Transport Police um, because I needed to see all of the areas that members of the public can't normally go. And behind Peterborough Railway Station, there's a freight depot and some fly ash sidings. And there's the great hulk of the old um, sheds where they used to keep the engines. And if you look down, you can see the original Victorian tracks. You can see I became a bit of a train geek um, <laughs> embedded in the earth. And that whole freight depot is very, very spooky at night. And that features towards the end of the novel. And I went out with a couple of um, British Transport Police officers and we were shining flashlights around um, and I was taking notes. I mean, I love that kind of research. And in particular, yeah. I love the kind of underbelly of our lives, you know, the infrastructure that keeps our lives turning. And of course, we, we all know in our current situation just how important that is, the people who do those invisible jobs that we never see. And although this is Lisa's story and it's about coercive control as well, it's also about the people who work on the station. Um, there's the British Transport Police over the road, but there's also the station manager, the customer services manager. There's a security guard called Dalmar, who's a refugee from Somalia, who works on the station and lives nearby. So as well as telling her own story, Lisa narrates the story of the life and loves of the people on the station. There's a British um, Transport Police inspector who plays in a ukulele band. And I did go up and sit in on a rehearsal for a local ukulele band and used a lot of the stuff um, that I got from that. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> and in that... fact, I did an event at Petersburg Central Library and they accompanied me. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it's the only reading I've ever done from one of my novels accompanied by a ukulele band. You know, that was, that was a first. <laughs> yeah, first and pretty special for those that were there mm. to witness it. <laughs> <laughs> And never has a, a train station sounded so exciting as to <laughs> the way that you've just described now. I'm thinking, oh, okay, Peterborough might be quite fun going down there at night. Um, what were the, the challenges for you of having a, a dead protagonist? Well, the big problem with ghosts, um, I found, is the first thing you have to do is you have to be really careful with your verbs. Because <laughs> if you use verbs like float or whisk or flow, um, your ghost sounds like Casper, the friendly ghost. Do you remember Casper? Yeah. Um, it's very, very easy for a, a, a dead narrator to sound somehow twee. And mm. if you think of the, the people who've used dead narrators, you know, whether it's Ali Smith or Alice Siebold, the lovely bones, or, you know, George Saunders in Lincoln and the Bardo, yeah. quite often they've used them to a sort of comic effect, uh, a sort of full of brio and something that's quite quirky. And I can see why it's very easy to go down that route because the whole business of having a dead narrator is so appalling and so serious that it's very tempting to have fun with it. But my story was quite serious. I mean, somebody has died in mysterious and unnatural circumstances. Later in the book, it moves into talking in the whole territory of coercive control and mm. toxic relationships, gaslighting, manipulation. So although there's a certain kind of sort of brio and ironic humor to Lisa's voice. I didn't want it to be too quirky. I didn't want it to sound like a fun Casper type ghost. And also the other problem is what are the rules of your world? You know, what can your ghost do? I mean, for a start, are they a poltergeist? Can they oh, knock yeah. on walls or tip things over? Because if they can do that, they can communicate with the living world. And then you've set up a whole other load of problems about how your mystery is going to be resolved. And I was very adamant that I didn't want Lisa to be able to communicate. But I did want her to be able to read the minds of the living because she's, as well as telling her own story, narrating the life and loves of the people on the station. 
she can see through their heads. She wants to tell us about their lives and what they're thinking and feeling. So I did have to give her that kind of clairvoyant skill. So mm. it was a really, really, I didn't make my life easy with this one, shall we say. <laughs> no, and there didn't. were times where I thought, <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> Mind you, there's times uh, when I think that with every book, it's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and before we talk about um, Harrogate and the award, um, you've mentioned coercive control. What made you want to tackle this subject in, in this book? Well, I think it's one of the most interesting conversations we've had around relationships in recent years is the ways in which relationships can be damaging even without physical violence. I mean, the whole issue of manipulation, you know, is there a single one of us who hasn't been in a relationship where they might have complained to their partner about something and their partner said, yeah, but come on, you're tired. That's why you're saying that. You're overworked. You're overwrought, i.e. the problem's you. The problem is not my behavior. The problem is you and how you're feeling. And we've all experienced that to a greater or lesser extent. And in a relationship that's about coercive control and manipulation and gaslighting, it's just that technique kind of writ large. And Lisa is in a relationship, as you find out in the middle chunk, with a junior doctor. And I deliberately wanted to play with a kind of romantic stereotype there. Mm -hmm. Matty is quite an eligible guy. He's in his 30s. He has quite a glamorous job. He's sort of handsome and charming. And yet there's a little voice in Lisa going, there's something in this relationship that's not right. And then over the course of around 100, 150 pages, the relationship gradually becomes more manipulative and more toxic. Mm. And we realize that eventually it will lead up to her death, but um, I'm not going to say exactly <laughs> how. And exploring the subtleties of that is such a gift for a novelist. Um, it's the subtleties of manipulation when you've got scene after scene to build those. Um, I, had, I had great fun with it. I really enjoyed writing. Funnily enough, that section was the easiest bit to write. Um, that was the bit that almost wrote itself. And I got a bit worried thinking maybe that means it isn't very good. And that's the section that everybody loves, that middle <laughs> chunk. That was the bit that just had to, had to be written. And obviously all the thoughts were already there for you then. You just had to get them yeah. down on, the, on the page, yeah. Um, well, you are one of 18 on this fabulous long list of books. Yeah. A bit um, too long for my liking. What <laughs> are my chances? <laughs> one in 18, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you you um, have been to Harrogate before and um, you know, this, you've, you've read a lot of the authors that are already on this list, previous books, and you know them, etc. cetera. Um, are there any that have stood out for you from your other long listies? Well, I'm reading Oyinkan Braithwaite, My Sister the Serial Killer at the moment, and I'm absolutely loving that. I mean, it's just got such sort of brio and daring, and I can see exactly why that's been so successful. Um, I'd really like to um, catch up with Abir Mukherjee. I haven't read him before. And I've read Harriet Tice, which is fantastic. I mean, domestic noir, you, it's such rich territory. And it's lovely to be, uh, I've noticed that Apple Tree Yard is mentioned on the front of that book, which I always yeah. take as a great compliment when people think that it's worthwhile saying <laughs> that people who liked Apple Tree Yard like, might like it. So I'm thrilled to bits with that. Um, but also Will Dean is one I haven't read and I really want to catch up with because I love a bit of Scandi Noir. I just absolutely love it um we went to iceland uh, as a family in february uh, last trip we could have before yeah. everything closed down and i'm thinking of writing something set in nordic countries myself i've also been to norway and sweden and there's something about the cold the snow and the ice the need to hide inside um, mm. the inevitable kind of restraint that comes with that that's such rich territory so I'm really, really looking forward to catching up with Will Dean. And then, of course, there's all, you know, the big names on there. I mean, just to be on a list with, you know, people like, you know, Denise Minor or, um, and Cleves or, um, you know, Val yeah, McDermott. Yeah. I mean, all those names, you know, are so, so huge. Um, I'm really thrilled to bits to be on that list. I, I don't rate my chances of the short list, sadly, because... Um, <laughs> Obviously, when you're on a list that's got a lot of really big guns, <laughs> you've got to stay philosophical. But um, I, I couldn't be happier. I mean, 
you know, Platform 7 hadn't been mentioned in any of the awards so far. And we all pretend that we don't care. It's not true. <laughs> we do. We really care. And um, no, it's just, I, I, I'm going to be brag, bragging about being long listed at least uh, for a long time to come, even if it goes no further. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, they, they are all fabulous books. They really are. And I can say that because I've read them all. And, um, yeah, you've got as good a chance as any, Louise. So, you know. No, that's very kind of you. <laughs> you're, just, you're trying to keep me careful. <laughs> you're trying to keep me cheerful there. I nearly said cheerful. That's all right. <laughs> no, I'm not trying you, to make you Thank cheerful. you for trying to keep me cheerful. <laughs> um, and before we let you go, um, I've asked everyone, you know, what, what does the Theeks and Old Peculiar Crime Novel Award mean to you? I think what it means to me more than anything is to look at that long list and just think what a just amazing broad church it is. I mean, just look at the sheer variety as well as the quality of writing on that. And I think it really shows that Nobody can afford to make sweeping generalizations about crime or thriller writing because, you know, who would think that you have um, a serial killer on one hand and a Nordic crime on the other and a ghost on Peterborough <laughs> Station and historical <laughs> crime? And it's so broad. And I, to me, that's the wonderful thing about being in this kind of marvelous category. It goes to the very heart and the very sort of you know the, the inside human nature in that it's very much about the worst things that can happen to people but it's also just such a huge canvas and I think that's what makes it such a delight there really is something for everybody on this list. there really is yes you're, <laughs> that's so true um, and one of them is platform seven which is published by Faber it's out now um, available from WH Smith in case you haven't already got a copy and you want to read it why not treat yourself uh, because you get to vote for our shortlist so if you want to see Louise on that list head over to Harrogate and and you can place your vote there. Uh, Louise, it's lovely to catch up with you, to speak to you, and I hope we get to do it in person again very soon. No, it's always a pleasure, Joe. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.